Okay, so this is part two of the manual handling uh, online lectures. We're going to move on now and look at risk assessment and some of the skills associated with that. So we're going to be looking at hazards and risks, figuring out how to perform a risk assessment and then thinking about practical ways to reduce the risk in the revenue workplace. So what is a hazard, first of all? And this is basically anything with potential to cause harm. So it can be um, another individual, it can be a task, it can be a chemical, there's multiple things it can be. So anything that could potentially harm you is a hazard. And there are lots and lots in veterinary practice. I've uh, listed some of them here, but there's, there's many others. So all workplaces have ways in which you can get injured, but I think um, veterinary practice might be uh, particularly hazard by hazardous compared to say an office environment where we're dealing with um, chemicals and medication as well as live animals. So there's lots of potential ways um, that things can go wrong. And we're talking about trying to reduce the risk of those happening to you when we're looking at manual handling in this type of workplace. So that's a hazard, something that can cause you harm. Risk then is the likelihood that um, a hazard will actually result in injury or an accident. Okay, so it's it's an estimate of how likely it is that something could happen to you. So for example, if you work as a veterinary nurse, you're probably quite likely to get scratched by a cat at some point. Whereas if you work um, in an office job, that's less, much less likely. So it's likelihood that an, an accident or injury will occur is the risk. Risk assessment then refers to the process by which you identify a hazard and then decide how likely it is to be harmful. And then once you've identified risks and assessed them, then you can go ahead and think about steps to either eliminate or reduce the risk. It's important to recognize though that it's not possible to make a workplace um, completely risk-free. Life just always contains element of risk. We're not trying to eliminate that, we're just trying to take practical steps to reduce it. So for risk assessment, we'll usually use a kind of a matrix like this. So if we take, first of all, um, how likely is it that something harmful could happen? It's either very likely to occur up the top here or not so likely to occur. Okay. And then if it was to occur, what would the outcome be? So something is likely to result in kind of a mild or less severe injury. It's over here on the left. Very severe, severe injury over here at the right. So that gives us four sectors. We've got one, two, three, four. We can then allocate risks to those sectors. So if we look here at um, a less severe injury likely and it's unlikely it's going to happen, that's a very small risk. So if it's unlikely to happen, if it did happen, the, in, the risk of injury would be, would be very mild. If something is going to be common, but less um, likely to result in severe injury, that's still a significant risk because while the injury is mild, the incident is very likely. Okay, so cat scratches might um, fall in here in a veterinary practice. If the injury is likely to be very severe and the incident is very likely to occur, that's high risk. So for example, a cat bite, if you're a small animal vet nurse, could be in here. Um, it's quite common to get bitten by a cat if you work with them and you know, the risk of getting septicemia or blood poisoning from a cat bite is relatively high, so that would be considered a high risk something we want to avoid. We can also have severe injuries, um, but we can decide that the risk is, is low in terms of how likely they are to occur. So significant, these are still a significant risk. They're not likely to occur, but if they did happen, the risk of injury would be very severe. So that's kind of a, a useful starting point with which to, to look at risks and decide, are they likely to occur, yes or no? how likely are they and then what type of injury might result and then you allocate your you know a quadrant here to to the risk what do you do then that's all well and good it's very you know it's useful to assess risk but then you have to actually act on it or there, there's no point in doing it so once you've decided that something might happen we can look at how can we reduce the risk then we can either eliminate the hazard completely so just reduce the need to ever have to put ourselves in that position which will reduce the risk to zero or we can say, right, well, we have to do that, but we're going to try and make it as safe as possible. We might need to train people. We might need to buy some new equipment. We might think about the design of the, the work area or the environment in which the task is performed. So, for example, let's say if we decide that taking x-rays is potentially exposing people to radiation. That's, that's true. Now, we could just say, well, we won't take any x-rays, but they are a very useful diagnostic tool. So we're unlikely to go down that road. We're not going to eliminate the hazard completely in a veterinary practice. So we'll decide, right, we're going to make sure that all our staff who are involved in taking x-rays are trained in how to do so safely. We're going to provide lead aprons, thyroid shields and um, screens to reduce the risk of 
people taking the x-rays being exposed to radiation and we're going to think about the design of our x-ray unit rather than having the people in the room while the x-ray has been taken can we design a new facility where the animal is restrained in a room then the person leaves goes in next door and while they're out of the room they can then take the x-ray thereby reducing the risk of exposure even further so that's an example of how you might actually reduce the risk in the practice having performed a risk assessment there's no good saying oh yeah x-rays could potentially cause radiation to our staff and then not do anything about it it's really important you follow through and come up with practical ways to reduce the risk um, another example let's take your ass to bring a very excited irish wolfhound who weighs 80 kilos his owner is waiting to meet him in reception so you've been asked to bring the dog from the kennel area back to his owner so just take a minute there to think about potential hazards that could be associated with this task and then steps you could take to eliminate or reduce them. So before we move on to the next section, maybe pause the video for a minute and jot down two or three potential hazards and two or three things you could do to, to avoid them. Okay, we'll assume you've, you've done that, let's, let's move on. So potential hazards, um, the dog is very strong, he probably weighs more than you do, so he could escape if he tries to pull away from you. Um, you could, he could knock you over um, accidentally and cause an injury to you. If you're trying to restrain him with a lead and he's pulling or jerking, he could injure your hand or arm. And, you know, the risk of all these things happening is quite high in this instance. This is a big dog. He's very powerful and you're aware of his, his personality and his temperament. So you can anticipate a lot of these things. So then you might think, OK, well, before I go ahead and bring him up, are there any things I could do to reduce the, to reduce the risks? So some examples. Um, you could invite the owner down to the kennel area to collect the dog. That might be the best option of all. Um, the owner is used to dealing with the animal and may well find it much easier than you would to bring him up to the, to the reception area. If that's not an option, like for example, at the moment with COVID-19 protocols, owners can't enter the practice, you might get some colleagues to help you. So rather than trying to bring him by yourself, get two or three other people if necessary to give you a hand. At least one other person is going to be useful. And then the other thing is the dog is quite excitable and he's been stuck in the kennel. You could allow time for him to calm down in the kennel area before you try and lead him up through the practice. So give yourself some extra time to allow the animal to, to calm down before you try and move him. Um, some of the people suggest sedating the dog, um, but just bear in mind that that wouldn't be considered justifiable use of medication. He's a healthy animal. He's nothing wrong with him. He's just excitable and you're not trying to restrain him for a clinical procedure. Um, where a sedative drugs always carry a small risk of side effects. So that wouldn't be considered a justifiable use of medication um, normally under normal circumstances. Okay, that's an example of risk assessment. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is you kind of have to balance this. You know, how far do you go? So for example, you could decide that, you know, we don't want to get bitten. So we're going to ask um, all our staff to put muzzles on dogs before they perform any in potentially invasive or painful procedures. So for example, before we um, inject animals, we're going to put a muzzle on them to avoid them biting us. That might be considered fairly practical. However, you could say, well, we'll ask all owners to bring dogs into the practice wearing a muzzle. So no dog is allowed to enter the premises unless they have a muzzle on that the owner has supplied already. But that's usually not very practical. Owners won't be happy about that. Many dogs won't need them. The muzzles might be fit them properly. Um, that type of policy is unlikely to actually be implementable or, or useful. So what we're saying is that it's up to employers and employees to reduce risk as far as is reasonably practical. So again, we're recognising that there's always going to be some level of risk. We can't eliminate it completely. At the same time, we shouldn't go, well, we can't do anything about it. We're trying to be, to be practical. There's kind of a happy medium here we're aiming for. So what we're saying is that take all reasonable steps to avoid risk, but use your common sense. What we want to do is try and get the task done as efficiently, as safely as possible. We don't want to use health and safety as an excuse to avoid doing things that need to be done. So that, that's important to remember. OK, rights and responsibilities. Um, the law specifies the rights and responsibilities of both employers and employees. In the lecture notes, I've gone through examples of these. So you can have a look at that and see uh, what type of things the employer can expect from you and you can expect from your employer and vice versa. At the end of the day, bear in mind, you're ultimately responsible for your own actions. So if you're doing something risky and doesn't feel right, stop and change your approach or get help. Don't proceed with doing something that you don't feel comfortable about. And just to mention PPE here, or personal protective equipment, 
Um, this term kind of gets bandied about a lot and people will say things like wear suitable PPE, but it's very important to recognize that the term covers, you know, thousands of different items and it's very important that you're able to specifically select suitable PPE for the job in hand. So there's no one size fits all approach for PPE. The example I gave in the notes was wearing, say, a disposable plastic apron while you're cleaning out a small animal stainless steel cage. That's fine in that case because you'll stand or kneel in front of the kennel. So the part of your body that's exposed to the potential microbes or pathogens in the kennel is now covered by a layer of disposable plastic. However, if you put the apron on and then proceed into a large animal stable to clean it out, the apron is no good to you because you're standing in the space where the animal was. So you're completely surrounded by potential airborne microbes and dust and dirt. So in that case, an apron is no good. You need to be wearing disposable overalls or washable overalls or waterproofs. You need something covering your hair. You need gloves. You need waterproof footwear, such as boots or wellies. You can disinfect when you leave the stable. So it is very important to be specific about PPE and to make sure you're able to describe what it is that's suitable for the job in hand. Um, I'll give you an example here. You know, wear an apron. Uh, that's my dad on the left-hand side cooking Christmas dinner. He's wearing an apron. You know, is he correctly attired to help me take an x-ray? No, he's not. Um, you need to be specific. If I want him to help me take an x-ray, I'm going to make him wear um, one of these lead-lined um, aprons that are specifically designed for the job. Likewise, people say, you know, wear gloves. Well, do you mean washing up gloves or disposable latex gloves or sterile surgical gloves or gardening gloves? You know, they're, they're all different. They all have a different purpose. So just keep that in mind in your assignments when you're describing PPE. You need to actually specify what it is you want the person to, to wear or get. OK, so that's um, section two. We've talked in it about manual handling and how common it is in veterinary practice. We've talked about hazards, what they are and how to perform a risk assessment. And then you must follow through and actually change your work practice to reduce the risk. As I said, there's no point recognising something is risky, but then not making any effort to, to reduce that risk. And we've talked about the need to be able to select and use PPE correctly so you can specifically identify um, in enough detail to make it clear you understand the risks involved and how to, to avoid them. And remember, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own safety. So your, your employer is obliged to provide you with PPE, for example, then you're also obliged to wear it. So bear in mind that at the end of the day, the best person to look after your own health and safety is yourself. OK, we're going to leave it there for now. I'm going to pause the recording and then come back for section three um, in a few minutes. <laughs>